Part 1 You will hear a woman, Paula, phoning her friend Ralph about an application to the local council for money for their drama club. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 3. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 3. Hello? Ralph, it's Paula. Hi. You know I told you we could apply to the local council for money for our drama club, I've got the application form here, but we need to get it back to them by the end of the week. I could send it on to you. You really ought to fit it in as president of the club, but I don't know if it'll get to you in time. Well, you're the secretary, so I expect it's OK if you fill it in. Yeah, but I'd really like to check it together. Right, that's fine. Night, the first part asks for the main contact person. Can I put you there? Sure. Right, so that's Ralph Pearson. Oh, and then I need your contact address. So that's 203 South Road, isn't it? No, 230. Oh, sorry, I always get that wrong. <laughs> then it's Drayton. Oh, do you think they need a postcode? Better put it, it's DR68AB. Mm -hmm, OK. Telephone number, that's 01453 isn't it? Yes. Right. Now, in the next part of the form, I have to give information about our group. So, name of group, that's easy. We're the Community Youth Theatre Group. But then I have to describe it. So, what sort of information do you think they want? Well... They need to know we're amateurs, not professional actors. And how many members we've got. What's that at present? Twenty? Eighteen. And should we put in the age range that's thirteen to twenty-two? No, I don't think we need to. But we'd better put a bit about what we actually do. Something like members take part in drama activities. Activities and workshops? OK. Right. That's all for that section, I think. You now have some time to look at questions 4 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 4 to 10. Now, the next bit is about the project itself, what we're applying for funding for. So, first of all, they need to know how much money we want. The maximum's £500. I think we agreed we'd ask for 250 didn't we? OK. There's no point in asking for too much. We'll have less chance of getting it. Then we need to say what the project, um, the activity is. Right. So we could write something like, to produce a short play for young children. Should we say it's interactive? Yes, good idea. Right, I've got that. Then we have to say what we actually need the money for. 
Isn't that it? No, we have to give a breakdown of details, I think. Well, there's the scenery. But we're making that. We need to buy the materials, though. Oh, OK. Then there's the costumes. Right. That's going to be at least £50. OK. And what else? Oh, I just found out we have to have insurance. I don't think it'll cost much, but we need to get it organised. Yes, I'd forgotten about that. And we could be breaking the law if we don't have it. Good thing we've already got curtains in the hall. At least we don't have to worry about that. Hmm. We'll need some money for publicity. Otherwise, no one will know what we're doing. And then a bit of money for unexpected things that come up. Just put sundries at the end of the list. OK, fine. Now, the next thing they want to know is, if they give us the grant, how they'll be credited. What do they mean, credited? I think they mean how we'll let the public know that they funded us. They want people to know they've supported us. It looks good for them. Hmm. Well, we could say we'd announce it at the end of the play. We could make a speech or something. Uh, they might prefer to see something in writing. We'll be giving the audience a programme, won't we? So we could put an acknowledgement in that? Yeah, that's a better idea. OK. And the last thing they want to know is if we've approached any other organisations for funding and what the outcome was. Well, only National Youth Services. And they said that at present funds were not available for arts projects. Right. I'll put that. And then I think that's it. I'll get that in the post straight away. I really hope we get the money. I think we've got a pretty good chance. Hope so, anyway. Thanks for doing all this, Paula. That's OK. See you soon. Bye. Bye. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. So, Enrique, have you started your research project on cities yet? I've done a bit of reading around the topic and made a few notes. But, if I'm honest about it, I really haven't done as much as I'd have liked to because I'm finding it a bit difficult. <laughs> you don't know how relieved I am to hear you say that. I feel the same way. I think the key is to be able to make valid research questions. You're probably right about that. Didn't we have some lectures on how to write research questions? I think it was towards the beginning of the term. Yes, we did. I've got my notes somewhere in this file. I tell you what, why don't we look at the notes together and then try and come up with some research questions? At least that would be a good starting point. Give us some sense of where we're going with this. Brilliant idea. Let's get started. OK. From what I remember, a good research question is all about knowing from the outset what it is you're trying to find out. Yes. And now that I'm looking at my notes again, I see I've written here that it's to do with understanding and Evaluation. So, understanding a particular issue and evaluating any problems around it. And of course, a very important part is not overlooking any research that has already been done. Past research is just as important as what is being done now. 
it's a bit, I suppose, like looking at the research that's already been done and seeing if it agrees or disagrees with your own ideas.、Mm, sure, I hear what you're saying. But to do that properly, you have to have a clear idea in your head what your own research question is, and by that I mean、uh, specific areas you want to focus on. Let's face it, there's so much information out there, and we can't possibly include it all in two thousand words. <laughs> Don't remind me. The thought of writing two thousand words at the moment seems like a huge mountain to climb. I know. But let's try to make a start. I think we're meant to be identifying what makes a successful city, and also try to explain why there has been such a steady population movement of people from rural to urban areas. But I'm a bit confused because I don't think this is meant to be the main focus of our research.、Mm. Perhaps that's why the lecturer said we need to write questions. And that must be our starting point. Okay. Well, what we're investigating is more than simply what elements make a city successful, but we're also trying to offer possible explanations. So we have two questions: Why do people want to move to cities, and why do people choose to live in them? Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions sixteen to twenty. Now listen and answer questions sixteen to twenty. Okay then, I think the first issue concerning successful cities must be the economy.、Uh, people move to cities for better job prospects, and successful cities are cities that have thriving economies. That's true enough. It does mean that cities can offer good job opportunities, which seems to me. To suggest that a city will only be successful if it attracts the right kind of people to work there. What kind of person are you talking about? Well, I suppose I'm referring to the skilled labour force. You know, the idea that up-and-coming young people will move to cities, settle there, maybe buy property, and so that city will get the most talented, creative minds. But. If a city doesn't offer this, then obviously it will lose out, as university leavers will choose elsewhere. You could be right there, but I also think that when cities encourage businesses to develop, then you obviously have money pouring into the city, which can raise the general standard of living. So we've definitely got a question worth investigating. But. Apart from the economic factor, I think another point worth mentioning is the environment. Sure, we can research areas like the quality of the air, how clean it is, and then there's traffic. Um, is there too much traffic? How is it controlled? And also the issues of noise pollution and how the city manages its waste. Um, oh, and I nearly forgot. The environment includes green spaces like parks. Those are all valid points, but I think you've overlooked the whole issue of beauty. Beauty? Are you sure? What's beauty got to do with the environment? Well, don't you think if you were deciding whether or not you would live in a city, your first impressions would be made with your eyes? So the buildings in a city are really important. If the entire city looks like a concrete jungle, then it's unlikely to make people want to live there, is it? I think successful cities are those which have managed to strike a balance between old buildings and new ones.
So, of course, you'd have some buildings reflecting more modern architecture, but others that haven't lost their character and still represent the past. You're right, actually. I've often thought that buildings tell a story. I mean, you can tell the history of a place by looking at the buildings. I know exactly what you mean. And let's not forget that the environment includes cultural aspects. So, for example, what's the cultural life like? For me, a successful city will be attractive because it will have lots to offer, like a good nightlife and a wide variety of places to visit in the day, like museums and galleries, places like that. True, true. My own view is that some cities have an energy about them that are exciting to be in. And other cities are the opposite. <laughs> well, we've covered so much ground here. But I think there's one final aspect we should research. What's that then? The social aspect. Because, let's face it, cities are made up of people. They are. And surely a successful city would be one where there is a sense of community, a place where people would feel safe and want to raise families in. This topic is limitless. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a talk on ocean spills. As you listen to the talk, circle the appropriate letter for questions 21 to 23. First, look at questions 21 to 23. As you listen, answer the questions. Good morning, everyone. Today, I'll talk about unusual ocean spills that have occurred in the world's oceans. In November of 1992, people at beaches in Canada and Alaska noticed something strange. Blue turtles, red beavers, green frogs and yellow ducks came bobbing toward them. They soon found out where the strange creatures were coming from. A ship from Hong Kong was on its way to Tacoma, Washington, when it was hit by a severe storm in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. During the storm, huge waves washed 12 containers overboard. Inside the containers were 29,000 plastic bath toys. One of the containers opened and thousands of plastic bath toys spilled out and began to float across the Pacific Ocean. Ten months later, the first yellow ducks arrived on the North American shore. Beachcombers along the shore began to find the toys and reported them to local newspapers. But the people who were most excited by the plastic toys were the oceanographers. It gave them an opportunity to study ocean currents and winds. Before the conversation continues, look at questions 24 to 30.
Now listen to the second part of the discussion. Oceanographers drop bottles into the ocean to study these things, but it would be too expensive to drop twenty-nine thousand bottles into the ocean at once. Imagine the value of studying the plastic ducks and frogs. This gave some interesting information to the oceanographers. The first toys were picked up. In Sitka, Alaska, ten months after they were washed off the ship, some headed back into the North Pacific, while others drifted around the Arctic Ocean and headed for the North Atlantic. Many of the toys were swept northeast by the wind and were frozen in the ice of the Bering Sea. They're expected to cross the North Pole and float on down to the British Isles. This reminds me of another unusual ocean spill. In 1990, a ship traveling to the west coast of the United States from Korea was caught in a severe storm. The waves swept 21 containers of Nike shoes into the water. Scientists estimate that about 80,000 running, jogging, and hiking shoes, 40,000 pairs of shoes to you and me. Hit the water at once. The shoes were for men, women, and children. About six months later, people at beaches from Oregon to British Columbia began to find running shoes washed ashore. By the end of the year, Washington newspapers reported people finding hundreds of shoes. In Seattle, thousands of shoes floated to shore. Since the shoes were not attached, they arrived one at a time. The shoes were dirty, but after they were washed, they were still in good condition. People set up exchanges to find matches for their shoes. Oceanographers studied the information to learn more about the ocean. Some Nike shoes reached Hawaii; others went to the Philippines and Japan. According to the scientists, some of the shoes are on a trip around the world and should end up back in Washington. And Oregon, can you believe it? Many pairs of running shoes, as well as plastic ducks and frogs, are still on their ocean journey. So, if you go to a beach anywhere in the world, don't be surprised if you see a green plastic frog or a woman's size seven jogging shoe bobbing toward you. So keep your eyes out, so you may find free bath toys and even a new pair of shoes. Thank you for attending my lecture. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to part four. You will hear part of a lecture about the school calendar. Listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. So, having seen that the six-term system has passed the test of cost-effectiveness, we can move on to the educational aspects of this arrangement. Firstly, all the terms would be approximately the same length. 
Instead of terms up to 13 weeks, which we have now, there could be a repeating pattern of seven weeks of term time plus two weeks of vacation. This would be repeated six times per year. How does this affect the effectiveness of the educational provision? The most noticeable result would be that the very long summer holiday would be reduced in length. This byproduct of the six term system could be beneficial. There's plenty of evidence of huge learning loss by pupils during the summer holidays. By learning loss, we mean the amount that pupils forget or lose during a holiday break. Ashley carried out a number of analyses which showed this conclusively. He investigated 39 studies examining the effects of summer holidays on standardized test scores. His analyses indicated that summer learning loss equaled two weeks to seven weeks of instruction. On average, children's test scores were three weeks lower than when they left school in the previous term. He also found differences in the learning loss effect according to subject. The subjects he analysed were reading, writing and maths, and he found that the effect was greatest in maths and reading. Furthermore, although all social groups experienced roughly similar learning loss in the field of maths, the studies found that disadvantaged children showed even greater losses in reading skills. So, the problem of learning loss in traditional schools is clear. However, the results of studies into the six-term system and learning loss are ambiguous. Marchmont found that pupils in six-term schools maintained their test scores after the shorter holiday period. This is certainly an improvement on the traditional system where, as we have seen, pupils perform worse after the summer break. Benson, however, found no differences between those in traditional schools and on the six-term schedule. It would seem reasonable that if long holidays result in learning loss, then shorter holidays should result in less learning loss. So, we await the outcome of further studies. Historically, of course, everyone knows the reason for our system of three terms per year. In days when agriculture was of much greater importance in our working lives, it was essential that the children helped with the harvest. Later on, this changed and more people moved into the towns. But then there was a new problem. Before air conditioning, it was very impractical to try to teach children in the summer months. Nowadays, that's no longer a barrier. One way of providing something different is the summer school. Here, there is a completely different kind of educational provision. Cooper and others investigated 93 summer schools and the results they achieved. They all had a positive effect on learning. Most summer schools, of course, have small classes and class size was shown to have a positive effect. Additionally, summer school children usually benefit from a great deal of parental support, not least because payment of fees is involved, and this, as so often, was shown to produce very good outcomes. Results were most impressive, in maths in general. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.